This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. In this show, scientist Kevin Tranberth on record ocean warming, impacts now and for centuries to come. It's all oceans this week on Radio Eco Shock. Most of the heat from our greenhouse gases have been absorbed by the Earth's ocean. Sea temperatures are rising. Ocean heat content in 2019 was the warmest on record by a big margin. Some say it's four times more than all the energy used by the humans on the planet. That heat will come back to future generations for centuries. It is leading more extreme weather around the world right now, according to scientists. The latest study is titled, Record-Setting Ocean Warmth Continued in 2019. That was published in February 2020 in the journal Advances in Atmospheric Science. Dr. Kevin Trenberth is a co-author. Kevin is known as a senior scientist at NCAR, the U.S. National Center for Atmospheric Research. He is currently on leave visiting the University of Auckland in his native New Zealand. From Auckland, Kevin Trenberth, welcome back to Radio EcoShock. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Just as an opening shot, why should listeners care if the world's oceans are getting a little warmer? The world's oceans effectively are the main memory of climate change. So we have increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The dominant one is carbon dioxide, which has increased by more than 40% since pre-industrial levels. And half of that increase has occurred since 1985. And so we've got very good measurements of that. We know that these greenhouse gases trap the outgoing radiation and they produce warming. That warming has all kinds of consequences in terms of things like storms and so on in the atmosphere, drought and and heat waves. It also is melting ice around the planet, so Greenland, uh, Arctic sea ice, Antarctica are melting, uh, but it ends up that most of the energy imbalance that is created goes into the oceans. And so the oceans are systematically warmer, and they're the best single indicator that the planet is actually warming. Uh, With a warmer ocean, the oceans expand, so that increases sea level. We have completely independent measurements of sea level, and sea level is indeed going up on a regular basis, and the melt of uh, land ice puts more water into the ocean. That also increases sea level, and so there's a double whammy for the sea level rise. But the ocean heat content is very steadily going upwards. Most years have been record years. The only exception was 2016, and that was because that was a major El Nino year, and a lot of heat came out of the ocean in that year, into the atmosphere, and that's why uh, that created the hottest global mean surface temperature around the world. So 2016 is the warmest from the standpoint of the surface air temperature, but in terms of the heat and energy in the planet, 2019 certainly stands out. How do we know that this warming in the sea is not just part of a much longer cycle? For example, did the oceans get colder during the ice ages and maybe they're just warming up naturally now after the ice ages are over? Ah, yes. Well, I mean, certainly there have been variations in the past. And so a lot of the work which I have been doing is to try to understand why. And so my research has been focused on Earth's energy imbalance and actually tracking the energy flows through the climate system. So even if it's natural variability, it has to have a cause. The changes have to relate to the amount of energy that's going into the ocean or being redistributed within the ocean. Now we can measure that. The other thing uh, we can do in which we included in this paper is we can actually track the warming that's going on in the ocean. And so there was very little warming below 300 meters depth prior to about 1980, let us say. And then we could track the warming penetrating down below 300 meters to, say, the 700-meter level into the early 1990s, and it wasn't until the uh, early to mid-1990s that we could track the heat below 700 meters, and now we're tracking it uh, down to 2,000 meters quite well. Um, We have these new observations called 
Argo, the Argo array. These are profiling floats. They're quite impressive devices. They're quite long, slender tubes, and they have a chamber inside that can be uh, either evacuated, in which case the floats rise to the surface, or filled with water, seawater, and they, in which case they sink. And they uh, do profiles of the top 2,000 meters of the ocean about uh, once a week or thereabouts. And when they're at the surface, they telemeter that information on uh, both temperature and salinity back to space-based stations. And so we can track uh, exactly now the, the fact that the heat is coming in from the surface and how it's penetrating. And so we can actually watch global warming in action. And, of course, we can do other calculations with uh, models and measure, make measurements at the top of the atmosphere from satellites to indicate what the energy imbalance is. And now we can track where all of this energy is going. Being humans, we tend to focus on things like losing seafood, which is happening. But let's talk about something else, starting with evaporation. Does a warmer ocean release more water vapor into the atmosphere? So the warming itself... Most of the heat from the sun actually penetrates through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is relatively transparent to the incoming solar radiation and uh, goes into the ocean. There's a certain amount that gets absorbed by water vapor coming in and uh, redistributed by clouds. But the main way the atmosphere actually gets heated is by the evaporation of moisture at the surface and then the release of latent heat into the atmosphere. This is the heat that went into evaporating the moisture in the first place, and it comes back into the atmosphere. And because there's a bit more heat available, it means that the rate of evaporation speeds up a little bit, but also the atmosphere, when it's warmer, can hold more moisture. And the rate is uh, 7% per degree Celsius, or about you know, 4% per degree Fahrenheit. So since about 1970, the oceans at the surface are nearly one degree Celsius warmer, and the uh, air above the oceans is about 5 to 15% moister than it used to be. And so all storms reach out and grab the available moisture and bring it into the storm so it rains harder, or in wintertime, it can actually snow harder if the moisture is coming from over the Atlantic uh, into North America, into Canada, and uh, the northeastern United States. We can actually end up having much bigger snowstorms as a consequence of this. And so this effect is actually larger than the total amount. Uh, and so this also affects the frequency of storms. It means you can also get longer dry spells. And in places where it's not raining, uh, one can get more intense droughts and heat waves. And this also increases the risk of wildfire. And so uh, all of these things actually tied together through the warming of the oceans and the extra heat that's available in the climate system. And so this, you know, in the news recently has been all of the bushfires in Australia. Tremendous. damage and smoke. We're seeing it even here in New Zealand. And so these are the consequences of the global warming. How can you be sure the ocean is warming overall, though, Kevin, when there are year-to-year -year differences, like the cycles El Nino, La Nina, where the ocean changes temperature? Yes, yeah, so we actually track El Nino in, in recent times quite well. In the distant past, there are enough measurements to, to help us with this. The measurements, well, after 1970, there were these devices that were deployed from ships called mechanical bathythermographs, and then they were replaced by expendable bathythermographs. So these were devices that were thrown over the side of the ship. They had a, a copper wire attached to them, and, and as they went down, they recorded the temperature, and that was uh, sent back to the ship uh, in motion. And so we have these measurements around the world. And we've been able to capitalize on those, given the information about how one measurement at one place relates to measurements at other places and times. 
and that's enabled us to do reliable reconstructions of what's going on in the ocean back to 1958. 1958 was the International Geophysical Year. Now, in the deep ocean, uh, even before then, there were specialized uh, measurements from oceanographic ships. They're relatively few, and so these are where the, you know the ships were went out and they actually threw a pressurized bottle over the side and filled it up with water and brought it to the surface and then made measurements, uh, and including the chemical measurements in the in the bottle. And so, although we don't have a lot of these as you go back in time, the changes at the at depth in the ocean are relatively small, and they occur on very large scales. It's not turbulent like the surface with waves and winds causing mixing and things like that. And so it turns out you don't need that many measurements to have some idea that, uh, yes, indeed, we, can, we have some confidence that the deep ocean is warming as well, even though we can't uh, reconstruct the patterns around the uh, ocean as well as we can above 2,000 meters now. More and more, I'm hearing scientists recommend we stop talking about global mean temperature, as the IPCC does, for example, as our measurement for warming, and use ocean heat content instead. What is the debate there, Kevin? Well, it's, they're different things, of course. The, the surface temperature is where we, where we live, and it has direct implications for agriculture and forests and so on. And so it's very important from that standpoint, but there's a lot of weather variability uh, at the surface. The, the surface is quite profoundly affected by changes in storm tracks from one year to the next, and some of those are associated with things like El Nino events. And so there's quite a lot of natural variability or, you know, from a, a mechanical standpoint, we would refer to it as noise compared with the signal we're looking for in terms of the global warming. In contrast, in the ocean, the signal-to-noise ratio is much, much higher. It's the highest of any measurement that we can make. And sea level, the sea level rise is the second highest, not very far behind. And if we want to know whether the planet is warming, the ocean heat content and the sea level rise provide the two best indicators in terms of confidence that the ocean is warming. And in fact, uh, you can confidently say that the ocean is warming with just about uh, four years. And then we can say it very confidently, with four years of record, the ocean is warming, the planet is warming. And, and on the other hand, if we want to do it from the standpoint of the global mean surface temperature, we need more like 15 years of, of data. So we have heat waves on land. We've all experienced those. Apparently the sea has heat waves as well. What are the impacts of those marine heat waves for living creatures and, and the ecology? Yes, so as the ocean warms, the natural variability, uh, some of it's associated with El Nino, but also it's simply chance through the weather. Uh, uh, anticyclones sit in one place for a while, and, and as a result, the sun shines down, the surface of the ocean warms up, uh, there's less uh, mixing by winds, and you end up with this uh, relatively hot spot uh, in the oceans. Uh, we've had those, of course, in the past, but nowadays, when they occur, they break records because they go outside of the previous natural variability. And we're simply seeing more and more of these around the world. Some of them have lasted for as long as a couple of years, but usually they end up wiping themselves out because a hot spot sort of attracts more atmospheric uh, activity above it, ultimately more convection. And as a result, there's more wind and uh, mixing that goes on, and so it sort of wipes itself out. But then another hot spot is forming somewhere else. So in 2017, uh, the, one of the hot spots that formed was in the Gulf of Mexico, and that actually led to Hurricane Harvey, which produced prodigious amounts of rain, over 60 inches of rain in uh, Texas. And uh, the subsequent year, the next year, uh, off the coast of Carolinas was where one of the hotspots formed, and uh, that led to uh, Hurricane Florence, uh, again, with uh, very high rainfall amounts, something like 30 to 40 inches of rain in the Carolinas. Perhaps the biggest marine heat wave that's known about was called the Blob. It was actually given a name. You can Google it. And uh, this was formed in the North Pacific Ocean, in the extra tropics and it lasted from about 2014 through 2015. 
and had devastating consequences for marine life throughout the entire web, sometimes called the food web, but uh, there were profound effects on the, the phytoplankton, the, the tiniest creatures that exist, and also the zooplankton, and, and these form the food for fish, and so there were profound effects on fish, and uh, several species of fish were really knocked back. Uh, uh, the cod, the estimated loss of cod in the North Pacific in those two years was about 100 million, 100 million cod were lost. And, uh, and so up through the, the chain. So it also affects the marine mammals, including whales and uh, otters and seals. And then, of course, also the birds, the seabirds. And many of these have been documented. You know, there were, what was it? The humpback whale, I think it was, where there were estimated that there was over 100 humpback whales lost as a consequence of all of this. And so it affects different species a little differently, but it does tend to propagate throughout the entire ecosystems within the ocean. Radio Ecoshock. This is Shocking Stuff. I'm Alex Smith. My guest is Dr. Kevin Trenberth, climate scientist currently visiting the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Kevin is co-author of an unsettling paper reporting the oceans just keep getting hotter. Are you touched on this, but is the whole ocean warming up evenly? And if not, where is it getting hotter? It's warming up most places. Uh, there are a few spots that it hasn't warmed very much. One of them is just south of Greenland. This is an area which, is, which can be affected a little bit by the Gulf Stream as it goes up to uh, Cape Cod and then moves across towards the United Kingdom and up into the North Atlantic. And so uh, variations in the path of that can affect uh, that particular region. And it's also perhaps related to a phenomenon called the uh, Atlantic uh, meridional overturning circulation. So it's related to ocean currents. Uh, within the ocean. And so naturally, as the climate is changing, uh, the winds change a little bit, the ocean currents change a little bit, and so some spots can actually get a little bit cooler. There's not very many at the surface. If you look down below the surface, the most uh, profound warming is occurring over the southern oceans. Uh, there's very strong winds down there. It, it, the, any heating at the surface gets carried downwards and mixed uh, throughout a, a very deep layer, and uh, also the North Atlantic uh, in general, uh, aside from this region just south of Greenland, uh, because of the uh, cold, dry air that occurs in winter over the continents, and then uh, from North America flows out over the Gulf Stream, there are tremendous uh, losses of heat that go into the atmosphere from the Gulf Stream as a result of that. So the strong cooling of the ocean and warming of the atmosphere, uh, both well, warming and moistening of the atmosphere in these regions, and that creates convection in the ocean and carries the surface waters down to much greater depths. And so these days, it's carrying down somewhat warmer water, and we can measure in the North Atlantic that, uh, indeed, this is a place where the heating heat is penetrating. On the other hand, it's quite different in the North Pacific or in the Pacific in general, and in the tropical Pacific, the top 1 to 200 meters is clearly warming, but below there, uh, in part, it is not. And so this relates in part to the dynamics of the ocean itself. The ocean uh, has a very slow uh, overturning circulations, and one of the consequences of this is the vertical structure in the ocean. And so... Typically in the ocean, you have the top 100 to, let's say, 150, or in some places, 200 meters, is uh, well mixed, and it's connected to the surface, and it's stirred up by winds, and the temperatures are relatively warm and, and uniform. But the deep ocean uh, doesn't get affected by this. And in between, there's this region the oceanographers call the thermocline. So thermo is temperature, and cline means gradient. And so there's this large contrast, and the thermocline is in part maintained by some of this cooler water from down below that uh, some of it spreads out from coastal regions around Antarctica. Some of it comes from the North Atlantic, and it upwells slowly in other parts of the ocean, 
And as it upwells, it actually pulls up colder water from below. And so we can actually see this in action in terms of the changes that we see around the world, that there are uh, some spots where uh, below the thermocline where it has cooled off a little bit in association with these kind of circulations. So a new expedition is measuring the sea temperature far down below the largest glacier of the Antarctic, Pine Island. I guess that's pretty important to know, and do you think they will find warmer water temperatures down there as well? They have been finding warmer water down there. One of the really interesting new measurements that uh, has been acquired in the last 10 years or so are actually uh, instruments that are put on the heads of elephant seals. And and so the scientists have been putting these on, and these elephant seals have got this little hat on their heads. And so when the elephant seals go in the water, they they go after fish and maybe chase penguins or something like that. Um, but they're making measurements in places that uh, ships can't go, and, and we're actually able to track some of the changes that are occurring. Uh, just incidentally, these instruments fall off once a year when the uh, elephant seals molt. And so they're not permanent, and so they don't do any damage. No, no animals were hurt during this experiment, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and, uh, but so we have had indications already that there is some warming I mentioned before of the southern oceans. Some of that warm water uh, upwells below some of the ice sheets and the extensions of the Pine Island Glacier out over the, I think it's the Weddell Sea, and also uh, the Ross Sea on the other side of Antarctica. And so it's eroding the ice shelves a little bit from below, and there are a few places where this has occurred, and it's allowed some large ice sheets to break up, and we've ended up with some great big icebergs as a result. But this is really being caused not so much by warming from above, uh, because it's you know still very cold in Antarctica and below freezing mostly, uh, it's the warmer water uh, from down below that is undermining some of these regions. And once the ice shelf is undermined and moves away a little bit, then that allows the glaciers to flow more freely uh, into the ocean. And so this is where some of the Glacial ice over Antarctica can get into the ocean and uh, contribute to rising sea level. Quick fact check. Is most of the sea level rise we have experienced already coming from melting ice at the poles or from thermal expansion of the ocean, that is, from the hotter seas we're talking about? It's probably about 60-40. So most of it does come from the melting of ice and putting it into the ocean. Maybe 40% comes from the expansion of the ocean overall. If the ocean hadn't absorbed all the extra heat that we're creating with our fossil fuels, Earth would, I guess, already be too hot for humans to survive right now. And that's the good news. But, Kevin, when will all that heat come back out of the sea and for how long? Some of it gets stored up in places, and in particular in the tropical Pacific, the trade winds and the ocean currents uh, the trade winds are um, northeasterlies or southeasterlies in the southern hemisphere, and they create currents which carry all of the warming surface waters across towards Indonesia, north of Australia, and they build up over there in what is called a warm pool. And they warm, when the warm water gets so deep over there, 200 meters and more, the ocean sort of says, whoa, too much, and it has an El Nino event. And so this is one way in which the El Nino events uh, come about. And so that warm water then spreads across the tropical Pacific, uh, and some of that heat comes back into the atmosphere. There's a lot of uh, extra hurricane and thunderstorm activity that heats the atmosphere up, and that's why we have the warmest years during El Nino years in, in the atmosphere. And the ocean cools in the process. So the El Nino is a process whereby it can actually moderate the temperatures a little bit and so the uh, tropical Pacific hasn't warmed up quite as much as uh, some other regions as a result of this kind of thing. But mostly, uh, once the heat goes into the ocean, the process is pretty well irreversible. The mixing, uh, you know, if you take uh, some hot water out of your hot water tap and cold water out of your cold water tap and mix them together, you end up with warm water 
and no amount of shaking it up anymore will put it back the way it was into a pile of hot water and a pile of cold water. So you can't get that hot water back in the same way. And so this is a part of the global warming process, that the oceans gradually warm up, sea level continues to rise, and as a result, certainly the, the surface conditions are somewhat more moderate, but it doesn't come back to haunt us in quite the same way it does during El Nino events. It does mean that the air above the oceans is warmer and moister than it used to be. The team for this research was led by Li Zheng Sheng from the International Center for Climate and Environmental Studies in Beijing. Can we chart out the future direction for warming oceans? Do we know what to expect? There is, of course, climate models or Earth system models, uh, which include biology and so on. And these are certainly getting better. Uh, having uh, observational estimates as to what's going on helps to validate or to check the veracity of these models. And so the models are getting better, and these are the tools we use to make projections uh, into the future. And so there are projections of you know, how much ocean heat there is in the future and also sea level rise. And this is one of the very worrying things, because even if we stop increasing the concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, you know, they're still there and they have a long lifetime. Carbon dioxide has a long lifetime. And so the oceans keep warming up for probably centuries into the future and sea level continues to rise for centuries into the future. And so even if we do get the global warming under control, there will be some consequences going further into the future. It's not like if I go down to the beach in Vancouver, I can feel the difference next year. Ooh, the ocean feels a little warmer. It's it's not like that at all. I mean, the ocean absorbs huge amounts of heat and then it changes relatively slowly. But are there tipping points where bigger, more dangerous systems could be set into motion? Do we know where the limits are? This is right. I already mentioned that a lot of the warming of the ocean is probably irreversible on a century timescale. Uh, you know, I mean, if we go thousands of years, then, of course, we can go back. Uh, but uh, from uh, a human lifetime, human generational standpoint, it's essentially irreversible. One of the things that's very worried is that some of these effects could create major tipping points, so-called, uh, we call them uh, nonlinearities, and so you know, suddenly things begin to break and, or change quite radically. And so the North Atlantic is one area where this is of major concern, uh, the circulation related to the Gulf Stream and this, this thing called the AMOC. Uh, if that uh, changes, then the storm tracks across the Atlantic going into Europe and into the United Kingdom uh, even if they only shift a few degrees of latitude southwards, and suddenly one region is a lot wetter than it used to be, and other regions are a lot drier, and there are profound local effects on, on climate that uh, may be almost uh, irreversible. And so this is one kind of tipping point that is uh, of a concern. Uh, the other kinds that are especially of concern are uh, melting of uh, Greenland, melting of parts of Antarctica, the West Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, this is this relates to these uh, this undermining of the uh, ice shelves around Antarctica. That uh, you know maybe it's already irreversible. We can't stop it, and it might keep going. And you know if the West Antarctic ice sheet melts, then suddenly the sea or not suddenly, but you know, over a time scale of a, of a couple of centuries or, or maybe a little longer, the sea level goes up by um, six meters, maybe uh, 20 feet, uh, something like that. And coastal regions are then in great jeopardy. As a result, uh, you know, at the moment, we're expecting that by 2100, sea level will go up by about uh, 30 centimeters, about a foot. But uh, there's a lot of uncertainty attached to that. It could easily be double that and some people worry that it could be uh, three times that, so it could be as much as a, a meter uh, rise by 2100. And, and, and one way to think about it is that, well, it's not so much what, but, uh, but when. And so, you know, if we don't get a meter by 2100, we might by 2130. It, it's sort of sooner or later it's going to happen, and we need to worry about that.
We've been speaking with Dr. Kevin Trenberth, a leading authority on climate change, often quoted in the media. We reached him at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Find a link to this paper, Record-Setting Ocean Warmth Continued in 2019, in my weekly show blog published Wednesdays at ecoshock.org. Kevin, thank you again for helping our listeners understand this key science. You're most welcome. It's a, it's a very important topic, and that's why I, I try to help. You're listening to EcoShock Radio for the world. I'm Alex Smith. Get it all at our website, ecoshock.org.